The gospel text for this Sunday is taken from Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 38. Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came up and questioned Jesus. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother has a wife and dies childless, his brother should take the wife and produce offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. Also the second and the third took her. In the same way, all seven died and left no children. Finally, the woman died too. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For all seven had married her. Jesus told them, The children of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to take part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they can no longer die because they are like angels and are children of God since they are children of the resurrection. Moses even indicated in the passage about the burning bush that the dead are raised where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, because all are living to him. This, the puzzling gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated as we continue. <clears throat> We've been on a, a theme for about three weeks now on power. And uh, let's see if we can maybe continue that theme as we go into today's um, today's uh, text. You feel power in your body. You feel it. It's not just something that's theoretical. It's uh, it's something that gives a sense of confidence. And uh, I think it's important uh, that, we, that we take a look at these in, in light of the scriptures that we read today. So let's, let's pray, shall we, as we go into it. Heavenly Father, you are the greatest teacher. Through your spirit, you reveal the words that your son has shared with us, your words. And then you take those words and you enlighten us as to what they mean and the truth that they um, carry. And so as we go into your word today, we pray once again that you open up our minds, our ears, our eyes to be able to see and perceive the reality of your kingdom where living water is constantly within not only our grasp but dwells within us. And may we participate in the age of the resurrection. This we pray in the name of our friend and Savior, who through whom all things were made and through whom he is holding all things together. Jesus the Messiah. Amen. So we started a few weeks ago with the idea of power, and if you just go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it is a declaration of power. In the beginning, God brought all things that we see into existence. And then all of Genesis chapter 1 is a continuation of the manifestation and the purpose-filled uh, direction of that power. So the first day, let there be light. And then after there was light, that let there be the firmament. We used to call it the firmament in the King James Version. Um, now it's let there be an expanse. Yeah, whatever you feel comfortable with between the waters. In other words, let there be an atmosphere. And then after that, let the waters be gathered so that the earth, the ground can appear and there'll be, there'll be land. And after the land, there was all these wonderful things called produce vegetation, not dandelions so much, I don't think, or thistles, 
but uh, but ooh, peppers, ooh, yeah, peppers and cilantro, onions, carrots. I mean, the list goes on. And then after that, there was the the shining, the epiphany, if you will, of the of the stars and the sun and moon. After that, there is the creation and manifestation of live life that dwells within water. And boy, aren't we searching for that now. Is there really any water on that planet? There's got to be some water. And, um, and the birds. And then after that, let the land produce living creatures. Life in God is life. There's power there. And then God says something remarkable. Let us create human beings in our image. And let them have responsibility for dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all that. It's, an, it's a sharing of power. And you have to have knowledge in order to fulfill the purpose of sharing power. Now, how does God do that? Power is, a, is conveyed through idea. I'll give you an example. Chapter 2 of Genesis. And God took all these wonderful creatures and said, All right, what do you want to call it? Why don't you do it? Come up with something. Well, I, I, I platypus. All right, it's a platypus. But naming something is pretty important because it exercises power. Do that with our our our, our pets because once they have a name and they get used to the name, you have power. Well, I'd like to think. We, I mean, my dog's not picking up my poop. I don't know who has the power in the relationship. But there's, there's this, this power, and it, it is circumvent, not circumvented, it is usurped by the serpent who comes in with a, yet another idea whose intention and purpose is to not only steal power, but to, 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 to ruin us from the ability of exercising power. So here's another idea. Don't trust God. Don't look to God. Don't listen to God. You can't trust God. Listen to me. And now, as you're listening to me, take matters into your own hands and only take in what you can see and imagine as you look at the fruit, when Eve saw that it was good and pleasing to the eye, there's the imagination, and desirous for gaining wisdom, that's a future imagination. That is what happens when this is the, the, the arena of power where if your future, if you can only perceive a future that's void of any purpose, then what's the point? And it drains us of our God-given power. That's why as we are renewing our minds, Paul can say, though outwardly as people of God, we may physically be wasting away. Um, I don't know if I like that particular term, but he uses it. Uh, and uh, though outwardly we're, we're just having, you know, it doesn't matter how great you build a house, eventually, given enough time, that house is just going to fall apart. That's just the reality of the world. And Paul says, that, well, although that's the reality of the world, yet inwardly, we're being renewed. You think, well, I don't, what's that supposed to mean? The imagination within our very being is the voice, if you will, of being able to listen and hear and relate to God. God says to Abraham, leave everything, everything that you're used to, 
Now think about that, because this is the, the, the father of the faith, Abraham. There's a pattern here to take. Leave everything that you're familiar with. Everything that you are familiar with. And go to a place that you've never seen, nor can you imagine. And then when you go there and you begin to experience this new place, then God in a vision says, I'm giving it all to your descendants. That's a vision that Abraham not only holds on to, it's not an abstract promise, it is a vision, it is a reality that, that Abraham embraces may not be able to figure it out, but he embraces, and as he embraces it further later on, God says, and I, because you trusted in what I had to say regarding this vision, I'm calling that righteousness. You're back into exercising power. And because Abraham believed God, there is the manifestation of power in which Sarah, who is barren, has a child. A life that's barren and cannot go any further because is suddenly given brand new, unexplainable power of life. It is unbelievable. And yet, right there in Abraham's world. And this goes on and on as God relates to God's people. I will give you visions. I, well, think about a vision. Think about that for a second. Okay, what's easier to think of? Just, you don't have to close your eyes, but I think it, it, it'd help. Don't fall asleep on me, though. If you close your eyes, what can you envision? A resurrection where people aren't given in marriage or a train wreck? Train wreck, right away, seen them, know what they're like. Because your imagination has been hijacked by the reality of this world, it is much easier and prone to imagine horrible things, disastrous things, than good things. And it's an exercise of power. Hope is the expectation of good things. So this is, this is really key because after a while we have to work against the forces that propagate the continuous imagery and, and thoughts within our imagination that are not of God, but are of the enemy. What does the enemy do? Kills, steals, lies, destroys. Name me a good drama on TV that doesn't have killing, stealing, destroying. And so we're bombarded with it. I find it very ironic as I was praying the other day and God said, I said, just praying over the area. He says, what's the highest place in this area? Because when I grew up, the highest places in towns, maybe you two, used to be the steeples. Usually Catholic steeples if they were. But they'd be big steeples. Anyone remember those days? You know what the highest place is right now in our, in our local community? A cell tower. How many images of God do you think is running through that cell tower? Oh, but we put a cross on it. So now it's okay. And it gives the church money so we can get down to 10 members and just pretend like, no, 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 no. That's another fallacy too. Yeah, <laughs> this is really key. This image thing. Being able to capture the imagination. I was with um, some kids this last week and, and uh, gosh, ask them about their video games and they cannot stop talking about it. And why not? It's just imagery and, and then this and then you go to this level and they just start getting I said, I'm going to teach you something that's, that is far more exciting than any video game you've ever played. What is it? The resurrection. What is that? Well, imagine everything in this world being completely recreated so that it's the same and different and the qualities are similar, but not the same at all. There's no more death. There's no more decay. And now their imaginations are starting to churn. But if you don't have that imagination, you're, you get stuck because that's how God speaks with us. 
in, in the Gospel of John, John writes it this way. Even though Jesus was doing these miracles, these, these miraculous signs in their presence, right there in front of them, they still could not believe him. They still couldn't trust. What does that mean that they couldn't believe him? Obviously, they believed that the person was healed. But what does it mean that they didn't believe him? They didn't believe in what his message had to say regarding what God was doing in the here and now. And what was God doing? He was advancing his kingdom. Now is the time in which God will dwell with human beings in a, in a profoundly new way that is the initiation of the resurrection. The resurrection Christ now dwells within all of creation. He is holding everything together. And the way in which we are separated from that power is that our minds are driven towards ideas that are contrary to that or distracting from that. When I was in seminary, we had to take a class. We had to take a number of classes, but one was on, um, I don't even know what it was called, but you had to learn how to lead worship. And so Tom, I'll never forget Tom. Um, Tom was in that class, and he, he was hard, and, and, and he took, okay, then what do I have to do? Okay, you raise your hands, and then you, you they pick up this, and you say, and he was, it, it just made him really anxious. And he had notes and stuff. He had, he could, and was practicing going through that liturgy from a state of anxiety so great that you... You ever feel anxious when someone's up there being anxious? And like, <sighs> you just feel anxious for them? Um, as a musician, I can feel that, you know, when the band would come up or whatever, and if, if, if somebody was not comfortable or confident in their playing, that insecurity would come out and, you know, it just affects everybody. But Tom had that as, as, as he was practicing the, the liturgy. And I thought to myself, you're so racked with ang anxiety, you don't even see that God's presence is right here. We've turned this whole thing into a presentation, a program. And so focused on the, pro not order, I'm not talking about order, I'm talking about the program. And you're so racked up in making sure that the program goes right, that you don't even say, what if God wanted to heal somebody in that very moment? Well, I t Tom would just have a heart attack. And this is how the enemy hijacks the power of God. Jesus says something very profound towards the last part of uh, the ministry. He says, let me tell you the truth. If anyone has confidence in me, if anyone believes in me, is another, another translation. If anyone trusts me, but most time it's translated belief. If, if anyone believes in me, he will do what I've been doing. That's an exercise in power. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. They think, well, my goodness, that's power. Jesus says earlier in the Gospel of John, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Well, you can't see what someone's doing in the, in the uh, non-physical spiritual realm unless you have a relationship and in your imagination you can see them doing that. So the ability to see God is what the Holy Spirit gives us the, the, the capability of doing. That's why in the, in the prophet Joel, in those days, in the days of the resurrection, which is what we're living in, the uh, resurrection was inaugurated with Jesus' own resurrection and has been going forward until that last day. Have you ever heard that in scripture? Until the last day. Well, if there's a last day, isn't there a first day? What's the first day of resurrection? Sunday. Yeah, it's the first day of creation, really. What's the first day of creation? Sunday. What happens on the first day in Genesis of creation? Let there be light. Who does Jesus say he is? The light. He is a new era, a new age that Jesus is referring to here. And, and 
as a disciple, we are able to see and participate as we grow in our awareness of that age. And it is extreme. In fact, I will say it is impossible without the Spirit of God empowering us through grace, which is God doing what we cannot do on our own, it is impossible to come to that awareness. But as God is leading us and changing us and developing within us the discipline of being able to hear his voice and see then what he is doing, hearing his voice, those, those two work together. Hearing and seeing both are important. You hear and you see. That's how we work in this world. That's how it works in the spiritual world. I go back to my, my, my baseball days when I was a little kid. And it wasn't all that good. But it was a good analogy for the moment. And, and, and from day one from T-ball. Do they have T-ball still? I'm like, I love T-ball. It's just right there. It's just can't miss T-ball. But when, it, when learning something, the coach would tell you, Keep your eye on the ball. But you don't know what that is until you can see yourself doing it. You can hear it, but hearing alone isn't going to work. Got to see it. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And so as we see, as we learn to see, once, once that one pitch went by, and I, for whatever reason, I wasn't listening, it just happened. I saw, oh, I, just, I just kept my eye right on the ball. Oh, I hit it. That's what he meant. Okay. Now the hearing and the seeing go together. John says in his gospel, we have seen his glory. Glory of the only begotten. No one has ever seen God, but God, the only begotten Jesus Christ, has made him known. We, too, will see God. And so as we're going through <coughs> these scriptures, what you have here are Sadducees who have not the ability. They have power because they have some of the knowledge which is given to them, but they can't see the resurrection power. At all. There's no imaginative quality to what they are thinking whatsoever. And I don't mean pie in the sky. I don't mean, because no one can do this perfect. I don't mean... Um, I don't mean something that's wishful thinking or hopeful thinking or think, uh, thinking of that nature. I mean the reality of going forward with the vision that God will really... See, when God gives a vision, many times we, we think it's one vision and then... Because that's what we do in this world. We see a vision and then that's it. Just an image. Okay? That's not how God reveals to seeing him. It is an ongoing reality. It's not one image. It's an ongoing reality. The kingdom is an ongoing reality. Um, I don't know a good way to, 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 to describe that. Um, we have pictures on our wall of our family. You probably do too. And we've got, you know, old pictures when, I was going to say when I had hair, but I, I shaved it off pretty pretty soon after he was born. Nonetheless, there are some. And there's this little baby, you know, this little three-year-old or two-year-old, whatever. And a uh, young guy, whatever. And, and, um, and it's on a, on a wall. I don't really pay much attention to it. But if I stop and I just look at it, I don't recognize it. I know what happened because I was there. But it's in the past. And the image no longer relates to reality. And if I keep on focusing on that, a disparity will begin to creep in. Where did all the time go? You know, you feel that one? That one takes you right out of the kingdom. We call it melancholy. Our good days, have you always noticed that the good days are always behind us? Most of the time, I mean, it's common in terms of people talking about that. Oh, yeah, back in then, and, you know, 
get people talking about things today. Oh, God, I just... Uh, da, da, da. And then open up some from the past. Oh, remember the past. Oh, God, the past is so great. You know, there, There's something to that. There's an imagery thing. This is what's taking place. The kingdom of God is in the here and the now. And as a disciple of Jesus Christ, the ability to live in the here and now, being able to hear, being able to see, is a gift that empowers us to engage with the kingdom in this very moment and work from and live from that power. Everything else is a signpost leading to that power, but it doesn't get you there. Let me give you an example. Um, I was talking to a friend, he's a Lutheran pastor, and uh, he has recently retired, and we have certain regulations uh, about retiring pastors. Uh, you, can't, you shouldn't stay in the church in which you were pastoring uh, for political reasons and so on and so forth. You can go another period. Anyway, I was talking to this person. I said, how do you guys do your, your uh, interim? Remember when we had interim pastor here? Okay, and uh, well, we, you, you, you do an assessment and you figure out what your needs are. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay. So uh, the church that you uh, this is Central Coast, or uh, Central California. The church that you came from, uh, they're going through that process? Yeah. And what did they come up with? You know what, Steve? It's not really said out loud, but what they did is they basically uh, called a hospice pastor. They just need a pastor to be with them as they die. I said, wow. It hit me in the gut. Why would you do that? We have no vision. You can't see. So Abraham's vision of life, no. It just hit me like, it's like somebody took a baseball bat and just, right, ugh. That's not Jesus. That's cause it, the reason why it hit me, because it's not of God. It's not of God. I'm not going to sit there and beat up and, oh, that's not, a, it's, you know, it's sad. But it demonstrates the the, the reality of when God does not fill the imagination, we're stuck. We're stuck as human beings with the images that the world will place upon us, which always leads us away from God into a mindset of God is not with us. You've got to take matters into your own hands. Um, <clears throat> You can't trust in what God has to say. Not really. Even if you want to trust, you really shouldn't because look at the real world after all. The real world isn't, you know, this perfect place. So these voices are constantly in battle. And it's something that Paul says, that's why we, Paul in referring to this reality says, the prince of this error is what we battle against. Um, try staying all by yourself in your house for two or three days and not talking to anyone and see what happens to your mind. It starts to go off the rails. Got to remain focused on God in the Word. Because His voice... God, here's the thing. God is always speaking. It's a matter of our A, we tuned in to the station, and B, are we not distracted enough to be able to hear? But he's always speaking. Always. And so this, this new age that Jesus talks about, the children of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to take part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they can no longer die. He's talking about a reality of the resurrection. This is the greatest reality of which the kingdom of heaven is once again merged with this world. Christianity, very, very uh, important to understand, is it's kind of a shift of a paradigm. Christianity is not about getting up to heaven. It never has been. It's about heaven coming down here and dwelling with us. I gotta think about that. But I thought the end goal was heaven. Well, heaven's important. It really is. But it's not the end of the world. 
the end of the world is when the new Jerusalem comes down to earth and we are given a new body to be in a new earth, in a new order of things, and God will dwell with us in his city. That is the ultimate uh, hope. That is the vision. That is the resurrection reality to which we point towards. And Jesus is taking it. And it's, it, it is hard to imagine. Can you imagine that? Not being married? Some people are like, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Um, or not giving in Mary? Well, what does that mean? Well, it's just, you just get a little glimpse and you go, well, I, it's, so, it's so different from our world. Yeah, you're right. It is going to be different. You mean nobody dies? Nobody dies. We're like the angels in the fact that our, our, we, we can't die, but this time we're also physical. Our physical bodies won't die. This is such a big vision. It is so far big that the imagination, it's almost, it's, it is impossible for us to grasp given the conditioning that we have of this world. And yet this is the hope that we strive for. Not to be a disembodied soul just floating around in the mist, but to have this reality as the ultimate hope. This is what we hold on to. And Jesus says, if you stick with me, you will learn the truth of that hope, and that truth will set you free from all of the voices that try to steal your power away, because there's power in it. The first Christians were more than happy to go in to the Colosseum and say, fine, rip me up. I don't care. The resurrection's right around the corner. Now it's, oh, just give us a pastor so that we can die. Are you kidding me? How did that happen? How did that sneak in? Well, subtly, like the serpent always does. Real subtly. Better be afraid. Of little fears. It, what lead to the big fears? Little insecurities. Well... So my friends in Christ, as we take a look at this, one of the things to be, excuse me, bear in mind is that the God who has called you, the God who knows you better than you know yourself, is not a God of any fear. Mm -mm. Not a God of despair. Not a God of weakness. <clears throat> not a God of double-mindedness or anxiety or accusation or blame or shame. That's not God at all. And those voices, even though may, they may appear to be godly, they're not. They're not of God. And as we learn to hear the voice of God, through the, God's word, there is a life that is beyond our wildest imaginations. And it's, at, and it's available to us all. And so now may the peace of God that's found guard our hearts and our minds, guard it in Christ Jesus who began a good work in you through faith and is faithful to complete it until that last day in which history will have fulfilled its purpose and we will live with God, reigning with God in this universe now and forever. That is who you are. Amen.